So today covering acoustic emission, uh, or also know it, you'll commonly see it abbreviated AE. Okay. And I do click for me. There we go. So acoustic emission, what is it? Um, <clears throat> a lot of people probably are familiar. Acoustic meaning sound, uh, emission meaning to give off. And so what happens is um, the the dictionary definition is when you stress a material, when a material is put under under some kind of a stress, uh, it's going to produce transient elastic waves uh, because that stress gets re redistributed through the material. What that means in plain English is when you bend something, it's going to snap, crackle, and pop. It's going to make noises. Okay. Some of that's in the audible range that we can hear. Some of that, a lot of it is also in the ultrasonic range. And so most acoustic emission testing is going to be done in that range. So we're going to apply an external stimulus. It can be changes in pressure, load, temperature, et cetera. And it's going to release energy in the form of sound, which we're then going to detect using a piezoelectric, uh, a piezoelectric sensor, which is the same, very, very similar to what we do in ultrasound, except in ultrasound, we send a sound wave in and then we, uh, we hear it when it echoes back or when it comes back to us. In this case, rather than we don't send the sound wave in, we put up some other kind of stress on the part, and then we detect what kind of sound is produced inside the part by those stressors. Please. How many of you, has anyone taken your uh, a composite project and bent it at all? Have you ever tried doing that? Take some composites? Okay. It, it, you can do it, and sometimes it needs to be released. Um, I was talking before we started, I worked at a ski shop for many years. And skis are a composite. Skis, snowboards, whatever, are composite. I mean, different layers of wood and fiberglass and stuff all together. When they're new, when we'd first get them from the manufacturer, before we put them out for display for sale, we'd take each ski, we'd grab the tip of it, and it typically was the bigger employees, myself and other, would grab the tip of it, put our hand in the middle of the ski, and flex it as much as we could. And it would, it would make these snap, crackle, and popping noises. It'd sound like Rice Krispies. And the reason we'd do that was so that customers, because customers come in and do this, which, by the way, those of you, if you ever test skis, this is not how you test them you don't go like this in the store okay but anyways customers would come in and want to do that and they'd freak out if it was making popping noises all that was is there were internal stresses that we were relieving in the um, ski by doing it once it's been flexed a few times it stops it's it's not continuing to now in cases of um, of structures that are being overloaded or constantly loaded that can continue to happen, and so we can pick those up with different sensors inside the part. So the advantages of acoustic emission, it can be done on nearly any material, metals, uh, fiber reinforced polymers, matrix composites, so fiberglass, carbon fiber. It can even be done on things like wood. Wood, wood is kind of a um, composite in its own right, right? It's different types of fiber and bonding things that are naturally occurring. Uh, or concrete, which concrete is a composite. It's reinforced concrete, has metal rods in it under ten, you know, for ten tensile strength. The concrete itself is for compressive strength. Uh, and so these can all be monitored in real time using acoustic emission. Uh, that kind of brings us to the next point. It's fast, continuous, and real time. So this can be occurring all the time. You can build these systems in uh, and be able to constantly monitor something uh, where you have data acquisition analysis and can be and is often performed on most often performed on objects while they're in use big example would be bridges there's a lot of bridges nowadays that have these sensors on them um, it can require it can be done using indirect access because we don't necessarily have to have the sensor right at the point where the sound is produced but rather we're going to sense it as it moves through an object the sensors don't need to be necessarily right near the sound. And we'll talk about how we locate them and, and how that plays into using the data and making an analysis of the data. Um, but it can be permanent or removable and it doesn't have to be right where it's at. And then there's minimal preparation required. Typically you don't need to remove paint. 
Uh, you barely, you just need to have a clean spot where the sensor is attached. If the sensor is permanently attached, you know, you're not going to get dirt between the sensor and the surface if it's, if it's epoxied in place, for instance. And so uh, it's very good in those regards. Disadvantages, dynamic process, okay? You can't do this on a static part, right? Some of the other tests we looked at, you have a part just sitting there and you do a scan on it, right? You run an eddy current probe over a part, you run an ultrasound probe over a part, you put, you put some dye on a part, right? The part's not doing anything. So if we wanna be able to actively or, or be able to get this, we have to stress the part somehow. But in some cases, it can be as simple as adding heat, you know, like we did for thermography. Um, flaws that we're looking for have to produce an acoustic event. Not all flaws are going to actually create a sound, particularly you know, an ultrasound range in this case. And it's primarily a qualitative, um, a qualitative method, although more and more algorithms are being developed, different monitoring techniques that allow for greater measurement and what does it mean? And what I mean by that is we know that um, a sound has occurred, damage may have occurred. Based on the, um, the profile of that sound, and particularly the amount of energy released, we might be able to get some kind of an estimate of the damage. Um, but it's very rare that we can get a super accurate size, depth, location, other than knowing kind of generally where this occurred, generally how much energy was, was released, you know, generally how big of an event was this. The other thing we have to be careful of is extraneous noise. Because it is sound-based, there is a lot of sound in the environment. And again, it, it's typically ultrasound, but there are ultra, there's, there's extraneous ultrasonic noises as well. Things like vibrations. You can imagine on, uh, on a, a turbine-powered aircraft where you have engines running at 50,000 RPM, uh, it's likely you'll get 50,000 hertz or 50 kilohertz noise, right, coming from that engine that's running. And so, or 40 kilohertz, 40,000 RPM, or whatever it might be, there's just, we gotta keep, keep be aware that there are other vibrations and other energies, uh, acoustic energies being transmitted through our parts and our structures. So the theory here is the acoustic emissions, they're the result of the initiation or growth of things like cracks. We've all seen cracks. Slips that are shown here. So a slip is where the atoms, um, it's kind of a shear type uh, loading. So the atoms in different layers end up offset from one another. Okay, and actually in this case, it breaks the bonds between them. Okay, the bond from one atom to another, this matrix structure has been broken in this left side here. Um, twinning is similar to that, or, or it's kind of a bending. You can see in this case, the bonds between the atoms haven't been broken, um, but it's changed the crystal orientation. Okay, it's, almost, it's bent it to some extent. Um, and other types of uh, things going on. Phase transformation is a big one. How many of you have been out on a frozen lake? How many of you have been on a frozen lake when it gives off one of those gunshot noises? scares the pants off of you. You think the ice is about to like break out from under you. That's due to a phase transformation. Okay, that can be due, I should say it can be due to phase transformation where you have water and ice, you know, changing phases. It can also be due to slips or twinning where the ice is contact, you know, is moving and contacting a shoreline or other immovable object and it's causing slips and cracks and that kind of thing to form. Or you ever have a glass of ice, you pour water and you hear pop, 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 pop noises. You hear that with ice? That can be, that's phase transformation taking place. So those are stresses, those different things that cause that. Again, changing temperature, changing phase, um, being physically compressed or stretched or put under a torsion or a shear force. Um, those are all different ways of doing it. These are elastic waves. They, they ultrasonic elastic waves, they have sound waves that travel through the part. So it's that movement of atoms. If you think back to when we did ultrasound, we saw the videos of all the atoms kind of bouncing back and forth as the wave moved through a part. Okay, that's an elastic wave causing that, or what we did with the slinky, you know, where we had the different types of waves. And remember the two main types of waves we looked at? What? 
transverse waves, that's the moving the slinky side to side. And longitudinal wave, that's where I push, you know, push on the end of it and it sends a wave back and forth that way. Okay, these can occur in both those directions as well. Uh, and so we, we detect them and then analyze them and try to figure out where did it happen, what does it mean, all that good stuff. So part of this process is we have to understand the ways. We have to be able to identify a relevant acoustic event from noise. And so the ways we can do that are we're going to look at the wave profile and we're going to look at different features of the wave profile. So a single useful signal is known as a transient signal or a burst signal. Okay, it happens once, not over and over. Most of the time, uh, uh, acoustic emissions of interest tend to be transient or tend to be burst. Okay, you're going to get, you know, think about like a bridge where cars go over it or trucks go over it. Every time something goes over, it's going to flex and you're going to get a certain amount of sound coming out of it, right? But imagine if that starts to fail and as a big heavy truck goes across, it, all of a sudden there's a much different sound that it makes, okay? So that's, that's a burst or a transient signal. So some features of it, some things to see here. The amplitude is the greatest signal strength you receive during this signal time period. So we're going to say if this, here is our, our signal that we're interested in. You can see there's kind of, it's continuing on before and after, but we're looking at this area of interest right here that's shown on the slide. So the greatest measured voltage or greatest measured amplitude Okay, is shown there. It's, it's, the, it's where the wave gets the largest. It offsets from the, the neutral or the center point the most. The threshold is we say, okay, we have a certain amplitude we have to get to before we consider it a relevant signal. And that's this line, kind of this line above that's labeled threshold. So you can see off on the right, our, our wave continues off to the right. That beyond the threshold, we don't care about that. That might be the normal noise or the normal, you know, the normal sounds of a part. The rise time, how long does that, what's the time that amplitude increases? Okay, from when it starts to increase till it reaches its peak. That's the rise time. Okay. I don't have it marked on here. The other one you can have would be the fall time. That's where it goes from its peak back down until it reaches the threshold again. Okay, but the rise time is important. And, and you take, then the next one is duration. Where does the rise time start? Where does it start exceeding our threshold? Until where does it no longer exceed the threshold? So the, the duration minus the rise time gives you that fall time, right? right? Or rise time plus fall time gives you your duration. And then we have counts. Okay, this is the, um, basically how many, how many cycles of the wave exceed the threshold. So that's what's shown here at the bottom. You can see we've got a count here where this peak, this slight peak here on the left, right? Then we get another peak, and then we get a much bigger peak, and then a little bit smaller peak. These are counts, and you can see the the duration, right, the, the larger the amplitude, it also means that that specific wave is going to last a little bit longer, or that specific count's going to last longer because you're getting into a wider portion of, the, of that, um, that wave peak. And we can count. So in this case, this, um, this signal, you know, this useful transient signal has a count, it has a count of eight, and you can see they get, they start fairly small, they get larger, and then they get smaller. The, the times of them get shorter. And then the last one here is what's known as MARS. And you can see it has the symbol E. On our diagram, it's listed as energy. Okay, it's also known as energy or total energy. And this is that area outlined by this kind of craggy mountain looking graph that we've drawn on here. Okay, and we basically outline it to connect the dots from peak to peak to peak to peak to peak. And we also look at the negative peaks. We do the absolute value of the peaks. And we connect the dots starting at our threshold. So connect the dots to the first peak. Now we go to the absolute value, you know, of the trough. 
and then to the next peak and then the absolute value of that next trough and then the next peak and the absolute value of the next trough. And then we add up all the area underneath here and that gives us a measure of the total energy in this signal. Okay, how much energy was released when this is. And so what we can do is look at different events that take place in a material. And we can look at what does a normal acoustic emission look like? You know, I'll go back to my ski example. I flex the ski and it makes a little pop because it kind of breaks in. That's a normal event. Now, I'm not a small guy. Ski racing, I've broken skis. I fall while racing, the ski makes more than a pop, it snaps. Okay, that's gonna release a lot more energy than a ski that I just pushed by hand, right? Same thing with the bridge example. Normal cars and trucks going over it, they're gonna release every time a little bit of that energy, that energy from the vehicle going over, pushing on it is going to create a little bit of a creaking, right? But all of a sudden that fails, it's gonna release a lot more energy. Or you can think of it, you know, apply to aviation. A wing spar is a common thing that is monitored with this. Plane takes off. You've probably all seen the wings flex up a little bit, right? Has anyone seen a video of a wing spar test? What happens, so they, they take the wing spar or the wings and they bring them up and up and up. What happens at the point where they exceed the maximum safety load on it? It explodes, right? So with, that's releasing a heck of a lot more energy than any of the like pops and groans that happened beforehand, right? So those are the kind of things that they're each going to have a diff each of those events is going to have a different waveform. And so what we can start to do is analyze these and say, you know, we put our we put our constant monitoring on a on an object and we say, okay, maybe this maybe this peak right here, this waveform, maybe that comes from just normal flexing. Every time we hit some term, you know, up and down and up and down and up and down, we get one of these little things that happens. And that's normal. So we can tell our computer, whatever is monitoring it, you see something like this, just ignore it. Or, you know, just maybe count it if you want to count how often it happens. But not a big deal. You get something that's 10 times the amount of energy as this, well, hold on, wait a minute, we need to figure out what happened. Right? You had a hard, maybe there was a hard landing. Maybe there was some really bad turbulence. Right? So in that case, you know, it's going to, you, you have whatever your monitoring system is is gonna trigger that as an event and let you know that there was an acoustic emission outside of your normal threshold. <clears throat> in doing this, when we, uh, when we design these, when we put these systems in place, we have to understand that there's gonna be a certain amount of attenuation that takes place. Just like when we send ultrasound through a part and we have to be aware that it's going to you know, that amplitude's gonna decrease as we travel through a bigger, more and more material. And depending on the makeup of the material, you know, some parts are gonna attenuate the sound, reduce the amount of sound more than others, or muffle it, you know, would be a way to say. So we have, that we can start to use this to try to help figure out where did something occur? You know, or how did it occur by, by measuring things like the, the change in intensity or the attenuation. So, directly affected by the sensor's proximity to the source. And a few things we have. When we have sound, when, it, when there's a acoustic event in an object, all the markers are gone. When there's an acoustic event in an, in an object, it's gonna originate at some point. It's gonna have an origin point. Okay, so we're gonna have our origin point. And that sound then, is going to travel, right, in ripples or in waves, just like ripples on a pond, right? So that has a certain amount of energy, right? At a given distance, that energy is spread over a bigger area, and then that energy is spread over a bigger area, and that energy, it's the same amount of energy, actually gets less and less, partly because of attenuation, partly because you're spreading it out over a bigger area. Right, so that intensity is going to depend on the amount of energy and how big of an area it's spread over. So 
signal energy spread over a greater and greater area or a greater volume, you know, if this was a 3D, it would be happening in like spheres, right? In a, in a three-dimensional plane. Um, for each doubling of a distance, you're gonna reduce the amplitude by about 30%. So when I go from here to here, we've reduced it to about 70% of its original amplitude, right? We've reduced it by 30%. This is in a flat plane. When I go from here to here, that's another 30%. So three times seven, we're gonna knock another 21% off. All right, so now it's gonna be 49, right? Here to here is another 30%. 49 close to minus another 15%, uh, 49, 39, 34, right? We're down to 34% of our energy, right? So you can see that that's gonna reduce that. Now, if we're doing a 3D structure where these are circular, that's gonna, that's gonna be 50% per distance. So from here to one distance away, we're gonna be at 50%, then we're gonna be at 25%, then we're gonna be at 12.5%. We're going to be at six and a quarter percent, right? So, so you have a logarithmic decay as you move away from something. The resistance of that movement in the part is going to create is going to dampen. That's that's the dampening effect that's taking place. Okay, where a certain amount of energy is lost as we you know have to as we move through a material. And it's going to dampen the amplitude of that wave. It's going to dampen the amount of energy that continues to move. And that's where that 30% reduction, 50% reduction in a 3D structure. The other thing that's going to happen is we can have wave scattering. And, and so on the board, I drew the you know, nice circles, right? But in real life, our parts are rarely a nice, perfectly spherical, homogeneous material. Right? I don't have a... Can't even think of something that's perfectly spherical, homogeneous. I'd say a billiard ball, but I know they're not. You know, they got different materials inside of them. Same thing with a bowling ball. They got an inner shell, inner core, outer shell, right? Golf balls got all these layers, right? Those are probably the closest we have, but they change. They vary materials as you go from the center out. You know? So I guess old billiard balls that were made out of uh, ivory, they're pretty homogeneous. So this wave scattering is if you have uneven or rough surfaces and or non-homogeneous materials, you're gonna get all these acoustic interfaces going in there. There's another keyword, buzzword. Who remembers what an acoustic interface is? Yeah. It's, well, it's where any two materials come together where the sound transfers from one to another and it's gonna cause a certain amount of reflection, right? It's gonna cause a certain amount of refraction. Did you mention that? Yeah, refraction, it causes refraction. It changes the angle it's going at. Uh, and so you're gonna get those, all those reflections, those refractions, the changing, you know, they're going to not, they're gonna, and oftentimes it's gonna direct that sound away from and reduce the amplitude of the sound that's reaching the uh, acoustic emission transducer or receiver. Some of the other things to be aware of, I mentioned we have noise, undesirable signals detected by sensors, things like things caused by friction, loose bolts, wind. You hear wind going through like cables on bridges or wind going, you know, making humming noises or that kind of thing. Expansion and contraction points, flexing. You'll also have impact, just the sound of rain hitting something, flying objects, wind-driven dust. Dust storms, if you're in a dust storm, like a desert dust storm, they actually can be very loud. We would get them when I lived in Salt Lake City, you'd hear it hitting your siding. And you just have this, this constant barrage of like white noise from the, from the sand and dust hitting siding. We had aluminum siding, so it was particularly loud. Um, things like mechanical vibration noise, again, that's where the engine stuff comes in. Uh, leaks, you get an air leak. You heard a, had a balloon squeal, you take the balloon and kind of hold it, right? That's like an air leak, you can get those squealing noises. Cavitation and things like pumps, bearings going bad, rotating bearings, that kind of, so. So we got to be aware that those other sounds are going to be in there. They might be normal sounds, they might be, you know, they'll produce 
those wave profiles like this, and we'll say, okay, that's maybe that's the normal bearing noise. Maybe that's the normal, you know, the normal vibration of the engine running. Maybe that's the normal hydraulic pump noise. You can see some other areas we might be able to monitor. You can monitor things like bearing health. You can monitor for cavitation and hydraulic systems, all that kind of stuff. Other, um, so to get rid of noise, we have some things we can do to help with that. So uh, we can use what are called electronic gates or filters, where we only look at specific frequencies. We can put physical distance uh, between our sensors and whatever it might be. You know, maybe the, the motors over here, you know, say we're, we're looking at the, um, looking at a wing spar and a tail mounted aircraft, well, we would probably put the sensors closer to the wing spar than we would by the tail, right? By the engines at the tail. Um, and then electronic filtering, things like signal arrival time, spectral content, what is that? What does that spectrum look like? What does that frequency or that, what does your signal look like? Is that something you can do? So the practice of this, how we do it, general system, this should look very, very similar. Sensor, some wires, got some kind of a monitor. It looks a lot like an ultrasonic system because that's essentially what it is. It's an ultrasound system without the, without sending the ultrasound in, we're just, we're just listening for the sounds that are produced. So here we've got our sensor. We've got some way of doing signal capture and detection. We're gonna have to use things like amplifiers, filters, and Pre-amplifiers, filters, amplifiers, we'll go into detail what each of those does. And then our measurement, simplest form, look at an oscilloscope, right? You've all used an oscilloscope in electrical lab to, to analyze AC electrical systems, right? I hope so, I see one on every bench. I hope we're actually using those. Um, even things like a voltmeter, which gives you amplitude of the signal. Or what's more common now is a computer, okay? So we look a little deeper into it. Here is our object. We've got stimulus being applied. There's a acoustic source inside of it. And we've got our sensor at the top and the sound goes to a preamplifier. And then that's, you know, that helps to boost that signal to send it to our actual instrument. And then that instrument's able to detect and measure, record. And now with things like, um, or even things like like algorithmic analysis and artificial intelligence, we can begin to interpret and evaluate without having to have a human involved all the time. We can automate some of this stuff. And then it shows different output displays you might have, you know, intensities and different frequencies, what do the waveforms look like, you know, scatter, grant, scatter plots, histograms, that kind of thing to, to kind of start to analyze that. So the sensors, if we cut one open, look almost exactly like a ultrasonic sensor, because that's what they are. Okay, this diagram looks very similar. This one shows a wear plate. This is, it basically is, they, when, when I looked at this, they basically pulled images from ultrasound. When you try it, when you look this stuff up, because it's the same stuff, you can use the same ones. And they can be portable, they can be one you hold there, they can be ones that are bonded in place using like an epoxy or something like that. But transducer, it converts mechanical motion from the wave into an electric voltage signal. Typically they're piezoelectric crystals using a, it's a ceramic, it's zirconate titanate. So it's zirconium and titanium. And they run in the same frequencies that ultrasound do. 30,000 hertz, kilohertz, sorry, 30 kilohertz, 30,000 hertz, to one megahertz, one million hertz. Like I said, fixed or portable. The different parts of the sensor, so we have our sensor, and these are gonna be very, very small, very, very weak signals, typically. Okay, the normal monitoring, they're not going to be big cracks and pops. If you're getting big cracks and pops that are audible, you're probably to the point where damage is done. Okay, so under normal conditions, it's not going to be stuff that's going to be, the amplitude's not going to be huge. 
So you're going to pick them up, and what you're going to need to do is boost that raw signal to get it to wherever you're going to perform your other, uh, your other measurements and that kind of thing. And that boost, those are typically a preamplifier boost everything. Noise, signal, everything. Everything coming out of the transducer is going to get boosted by the preamplifier. Okay. Then we put a filter, and, and then here it shows it combined. We put a filter with it to eliminate the things that are above and below the target frequency or below above or above or below. So that's called a bandpass filter. Okay. You can also have a high pass filter. Everything above a certain frequency is allowed to pass through. You can have a low pass filter. Everything below a certain frequency is allowed to pass through. You can have a band pass filter, which is a combination of the two. You know, you're high, you have a higher frequency, everything below it can go through. You have a lower frequency, everything above. And so that does a certain band. It doesn't allow things above and below the band pass filter. Then it goes to our main amplifier before going into, and that boosts the clean signal before going into the measurement circuitry. In actuality, it probably looks a little more like this. So the, the preamplifier and filters usually are near the sensor because we've got to, and sometimes our measurement circuitry, our output, they're pretty far away. So we've got to get enough energy into this thing for that signal to be able to make it to the point where we can measure it, look at it, and analyze it. And so that's often done. The preamplifier filters, those may even be built into the sensor pack that's attached to an airframe, that's attached to a bridge, that's attached to a given area, you know, where it's directly attached, where you're directly picking up the signal. Then that signal, once it's been boosted and cleaned, then it's sent a long distance maybe. And then when it gets to here, you know, to actually perform measurement, we got to do some more boosting of it. We, we amplify it more, we measure it, and then we provide our output, whether that output is a direct signal, whether it's some kind of an interpretation of it that's done, again, algorithmically, where AI is involved or where human analysis takes place. So analysis, basic forms, voltmeter, oscilloscope, what you see today is almost all computer-based systems. This, this stuff, um, acoustic, acoustic emission really didn't come about until computer-based systems were already here. Okay, so though you can use a voltmeter, you can use an oscilloscope, it really wasn't used much back when computers weren't around. And so it's always kind of been, it's much more effective when it is tied to computerized systems, when there is real-time analysis taking place, when you do have algorithms that can give you a heads up if something is out of the normal, because it's really hard. I mean, think about the, um, Think about the, the oscilloscopes you've used. If you're watching a signal on there, can you really tell like in real time, just sitting there staring at it? Can you get a really good idea of what's going on sometimes? It's just a bunch of lines on a screen and they'll change here and there, but it's hard to really interpret what that means. A computer can do that really well. So portable laptops or specialized devices, fixed specialized device. You build a computer that lives in the avionics bay you have sensors that are attached to the wing spar, and you're constantly analyzing acoustic emissions from the wing spar if that's what you want to keep an eye on. It can be other areas too, things like engine mounts and other stuff. So fixed systems oftentimes provide real-time continuous monitoring and indication. Big thing, United States right now, infrastructure or bridges. These are used in buildings, tall buildings. They can use them to judge when you've got wind and that kind of thing. Uh, how's it affecting the building? Okay, so you're seeing more and more of these. Again, civil engineering is a big, or civil engineering is a big thing. But what you often get is multiple sensors with multiple amplifier paths going to measurement circuitry and then going into one system to kind of, you know, that's, that's monitoring all this stuff continuously. And it can compare sensors in different areas to get a broader view of what's going on. So in order to do that, we need to understand where things are coming from. Where is our source? Where is our acoustic emission coming from? Okay. The easiest time to do this, easiest way, is if you have a homogeneous regular shape structure. This is that, uh, that billiard ball I was talking about. It's spherical. It's all the same material. 
Sound's going to transfer through it evenly. And then you can imagine as things become more complex in shape, become more complex in material composition, it's going to be harder and harder to uh, understand or be able to know where the source is. So that's where that qualitative versus quantitative uh, measurement comes in. Qualitative, we know something happened. We know something happened in the part. We have some idea of maybe how big of an event it was, but we can't really tell you where it was without using some of these uh, techniques here I'll show you in a second. The more complex the shape, the harder to determine a location it becomes. But there are some methods to do that, and we're going to look at linear, zonal, and point location. So the first one you'll see is linear. And in a linear case, you need to have two sensors, a minimum of two, you need to have two sensors. So if you have two sensors and you listen, you get the same signal, right? This acoustic emission source is gonna send out waves, right? They're gonna hit the sensor on the left first. You know, they're, they're gonna travel out in an arc, they're gonna hit the sensor on the left first. And then as they continue to travel, they're gonna hit the sensor on the right. And so what you can do is measure the difference in arrival time to figure out where the source is between the two sensors. Now, in a case of this, you have two sensors, it's gonna, it's gonna narrow it down to, in this case, a vertical line. Okay? It, it, well, roughly to a vertical line. There are ways you can actually figure out more than that, but we'll talk about that in a second. So initially, you know, it's going to say, okay, the, the, the ratio of time to the left versus the ratio of time to the right, it's going to tell us it's going to be, you know, this far over from the midpoint, X over from the midpoint. Now, what you can do is look at the total time. If it's offset at an angle, you can look at, like, total time and, and sometimes get a little bit of an idea of how is it offset from the horizontal plane in this case. But it could tell you, you know, if you're in a material that was taller, you wouldn't know if it was below or above, for instance. It can just tell you it's offset a certain amount here because of the, the total time it took to get to both sensors. But then you have to, you got to kind of work back to figure out how long it was from when the acoustic source took place. So difference in arrival time is primarily used to give you uh, a distance or a ratio between two points, okay? The next method we can use uses what's called a sensor array. So this is, you know, going back here, we have a sensor array. You know, in this case, we've got four sensors feeding in. Okay, so more than one gives you an array. So here we have a seven sensor array. And the design of this one is it's typically used in materials with high material attenuation. So very quickly, you know, as, as the sound travels through part, it doesn't travel super far, right? More attenuation, that signal strength is going to be reduced more quickly or, or, or closer to the source. So what we end up with here is each of these sensors covers a zone. Sensor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 covers a zone with the idea that if a acoustic event occurs somewhere on this surface or in this part, the sound will only travel, the, it can only travel up to the distance from halfway between two sensors. That makes sense. So look at zone one. If, if an acoustic event occurred here in zone one, the sound would be able to travel to sensor one right? We can say sound in this case can travel this far, okay? The width of my, the, the whole hang 10 or hang loose thing, not hang 10, hang loose, right? So I can travel one hang loose sound. So my sound occurs right here, a little bit up. So see, if I go there, it's not quite going to reach sensor three, right? Or if I'm here, it's not quite going to reach sensor four, so that sound will only reach sensor one. So if we get an acoustic event and it's picked up by sensor one, we know that it occurred somewhere in this cell around sensor one. 
but we don't know if it occurred down here or if it occurred up here, or if it occurred on the left or on the right, right? We just know it was somewhere in this cell, in this area. So that's where the zonal determination comes in. Okay, you say we had the same thing, you know, sensor four. Say we had an acoustic event where my thumb is in sensor four. You can see if I swing my hand around, it's only going to be picked up by that sensor four. But again, we don't know if it was in the bottom of sensor four or above sensor four to the left, to the right, right? We can't tell what that is because it's only picked up by sensor four. So the source of the signal is assumed to be in the attenuation zone. The, that distance, we, we, we figure the sound can travel. My little hand measurement here. That is the uh, attenuation zone. Okay, so if we're within an attenuation zone of a trans, trans, transceiver, that's the only place we're going to find it. That gets compared to a sensor array that allows for point location. In this case, uh, materials tend to have low attenuation, good conductors, things like metals, right? Metals have low attenuation. Sound travels really well through metal. Um, but here, what can happen is if we have a source, it can get picked up by multiple sensors. Okay, so what, what they're showing here is this, this source. Here's our acoustic emission source in the center in gray. And that sound's going to travel out. So it takes a certain amount of time to get out to R1. It takes a little bit longer to get out to R2. And it takes a little bit longer still to get out to R3. So sensor 1's going to sense it first. Sensor 2's going to sense it next. Sensor 3's going to sense it next. And what we can do then is draw those time circles around each of our sensors and we can pinpoint, we can triangulate our, our acoustic emission source where it occurred. So if we have any two sensors that get it, we can figure out where a point is on a line, just like we looked at with a, with a linear sensor pair. If three sensors pick it up, like shown here, we can figure out our position in a plane. And if you have four or more sensors, you can start to do a volumetric. You can actually do a three-dimensional determination. And instead of looking at circles, you're looking at the sphere that surrounds each sensor and where those spheres intersect with each other. Okay. And so things like this, if you have these sensor arrays, very sophisticated sensor arrays, you can derive uh, methods of finding very accurate location determination. And not just in homogeneous parts, but in geometrically complex parts as well. So you can do this real-time monitoring, and, and, and now you can really start to pinpoint it. So you could, you could arrange your sensors in such a way that if there are critical failure points, you can make sure those critical failure points are covered by at least four sensors. Right? And then also then your waveform, the shape of the wave you get, the energy content, the MARS, the amount of energy, right? That can tell you how big the failure possibly is in that area. So aerospace application, we're seeing more and more permanently attached sensors in hard to access structure, wing spars, uh, trunnions, landing gear mount points, as well as the engine mounts, okay? These are all things that can be, uh, one is they, can, they are, Exhibit, they, they are, not exhibit, they are prone to high stress. You know, think about a hard landing. Airliner has a high landing. You have a ton of force goes into the trunnions. That's where the landing gear mounts into the airframe. That's the pivot point for the landing gear. And then that shock wave is going to cause the wings to flex, right? So your wings spar. And then the engines are really heavy and are mounted to either the wings or the tail they're going to put a ton of force on those engine mounts, right? Even things like um, uh, uh, high, um, you get into high turbulence, right? That's probably not going to affect the trunnions, but it'll definitely get, do the wing spar and the engine mounts. The things are trying to move around. Um, impact detection. First used on the space shuttle orbiter wings after the Columbia disaster. In fact, they may have had them before Columbia but they put sensors in the wings and other areas of the aircraft that can detect impact. 
Okay, real-time monitoring for that kind of thing. Fan blades. There's talk about putting these things into the fan disc or other areas where you might be able to sense or pick up a crack before you have a fan blade failure. And when that, when that crack first starts to form, rather than the point where the fan blade comes off, hits the cowl, takes a chunk of cowl off, chunk of cowl hits the window, window breaks, the person gets sucked out window and killed. It happened a few years ago on a 737. Okay, so if you can prevent that from happening with real-time monitoring, that's another area they've talked about using this. And then another one you'll see, and this one's key for you guys, fluid flow and leakage. Remember in systems, we did hydraulic fluid flow by putting the, the clamp meter around the pump. We never did that when I was at the airline. We had acoustic sensors that clamped on our hydraulic lines. We ran our hydraulic system and those sensors based on listening to the fluid flowing through the lines, and it, you, it knew the diameter of the line, you had different size clamps. Based on the diameter of the line, and the, the sound of the fluid flowing through, the system could tell us what the flow was just by listening to it. It's a form of acoustic emission testing. So you'll, if you go work transport aircraft, if you do stuff with hydraulics, you'll likely use one of those systems. And that's one of the ones I'm talking about where it's not permanently installed, but they're installed, you perform your tests, and then you remove them when you're done. And then you can move them around to different systems different areas of the aircraft, different subsystems of the hydraulic. You put on the lines going out to the wings, you put on the lines going up to the tail, and you can do things like leachite. Or is there extra fluid flowing because the seals in your actuators and your valves have gone bad? Is there a blockage somewhere? You really don't get blockages because of the high pressure. Is there a leak somewhere? You can't figure out where the leak is, but you can figure out where there's fluid flowing in the system. You know, the lines going to the heat exchangers in the wing, we're getting a bunch of flow in there that shouldn't be there and that hydraulic fluid's going into the fuel tank rather than staying in the system. Okay, so you'll probably see these. They can also be used on fuel systems. They can be used for finding leaks in oxygen systems. I never use those, but they, they do exist uh, as well. So that is acoustic emission.